All righty. All you. All right. Okay. Well, um, good evening. I um, appreciate the opportunity to join uh, join you this evening and, and talk through uh, what was uh, what what was really one of the most exciting projects I've ever personally been able to work on, and that's the redevelopment of Howard Park. Um, but I want to be able to give you guys a little bit of backstory as to uh, how our park came to be and a lot of the business models and, and kind of um, processes that we put into place to help shape the park. And so these business models and, and kind of frameworks that all kind of go through um, not only apply to Howard Park, but all of the uh, efforts that we do within venues, parks and arts. Uh, here's uh, Venues, Parks, and Arts, our logo. Uh, my name is Aaron Perry. I oversee uh, the department. My official title is Executive Director, and uh, it's a really exciting opportunity to be able to um, have this whole suite of venues and uh, recreation facilities within our purview. We've got about 120 full-time staff members, um, $25 million annual budget. So you've got everything from a performing arts center and convention center, um, whitewater rafting course to ice, ice skating courses, um, citywide events, golf courses, um, community centers, a zoo, a baseball stadium, an art museum, and a greenhouse. Um, so a little bit of everything that kind of rolls up through us, uh, but we are uh, doing work that we think uh, makes a more livable and lovable South Bend. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, Everything, uh, when you get involved with city planning, you'll quick realize that um, people talk about master plans and strategic plans. And, and this is um, no joke, uh, a picture of my desk uh, shortly after I started the position. Um, there were hosts of, of plans that were sitting on the shelves. Um, many of them, I would argue, not very actionable. Um, they were uh, the, the kind of quintessential plans on a shelf. And, in fact, one of them that had just finished uh, was our five-year master plan for the park system, which said, hey, you've got $30 million worth of projects and deferred maintenance that you've got to do. Um, good luck. <laughs> Don't think you'll ever be able to get there. Well, as you'll see a little bit later, I'm getting ready to, to tell you about a plan that we put into place that was over $60 million entirely financed without raising any taxes or adding any new taxes. So, um, And we're not done yet. So. We talked about the more livable and lovable South Bend. We we put in together a, a, of course, when all those plans were in action, well, what do we have to do? Make a new strategic plan. So um, this is what you see here, and it's kind of what guides our work. Our primary areas of focus um, exist in these three buckets, arts and culture, recreation, and, and public placemaking. We like to call ourselves placemakers. Um, and we put a little emphasis on the term surprise and delight. Uh, it's that kind of comeback ability. It's the efforts that we sprinkle throughout all of our events and interactions, customer service programs and, and facilities um, that make, make the place special. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through a little bit of this. I first got interested in this uh, work um, I, I'm born and raised in South Bend. I had the opportunity to go to Notre Dame. And so um, always consider it a privilege when I get to speak, uh, hang out with Notre Dame students. Uh, congratulations again for those of you that are just finishing your finals and um, especially to those of you that are graduating. Uh, kudos, uh, that degree will follow you. Um, and, and it means quite a bit, uh, especially at a place like Notre Dame where it's not only about what you learn, but the, the manner in which you apply that to life. And so. Uh, Again, much kudos to those of you that are graduating. Um, but when I was in, in school, I started thinking about uh, a childhood book. But, you know, I'm born and raised in South Bend, and people go, "Well, what's going on in that town?" You know, I can't believe you live here. And after I graduated, people, you know, would say, "Are you going to stay in South Bend?" Um, and it harkened me back to this children's book called "Nothing Ever Happens on My Block." And um, I don't have it quite here to show you the pictures, but it goes through page by page, and Chester sits in front of his house and uh, talks about what some cities have. Some cities have fireworks and some cities have uh, marching bands and some cities do this and that. And meanwhile, he never, he forgets to turn around and see what's actually happening on his block. And he says, when he grows up, he's going to move. Um, so I had some friends of mine draw Chester in, in front of South Bend. Um, this kind of guy that, that never turns his head around to actually care to see what's going around, around him, constantly commentating on what's happening in other places. Um, I took it as a kind of a personal mission then to figure out how to get Chester to turn his head around. 
uh, I felt like that was a lot of people that that were around me in, in our community. And so um, when I think about Chester, here's kind of a modern day Chester. Do you remember this woman from the Olympics that, you know, wasn't wasn't good enough that she won silver, not impressed were, were the memes that were going around. Or I think about this lady on Splash Mountain, right? I don't know what it takes her <laughs> to turn her, her head around or what will make her excited. You know, that's the idea. That's why we inflict that surprise and delight that we talk about. A couple of the business models I promised or frameworks that we use. Um, this one, um, again, I'm talking pretty fast because I want to get a lot of these in and, and show you the main project. But um, this particular one is uh, what we call the pyramid of fun. And, and really, at the end of the day, particularly when you work in government entities or major organizations, um, a lot of times you, you, you talk about um, this pyramid is, is, are things safe? Are they functional? Are they in budget? If so, it works, right? Ship it out. Uh, since we work in parks a lot, I like to use the example of a, a park bench. Here's a, a classic example of a, a safe and functional park bench, right? It's in budget, it's cheap materials, it works. Um, this one perhaps isn't very safe, right? You know, you might fall off of it or, or cut yourself or get gang green. But I think this is where, where the conversation often stops in, in business and in, in large organizations, particularly in municipal government organizations. Safe, functional, in budget, ship it out. Every park bench would look just like this. Um, but as you note, there's still three rings left in the pyramid. And so we, we like to talk about, is there a way to make things more comfortable? Um, our cities, our places, and otherwise. And so I love this, this idea of the bench with the, the footrest, right? Um, this was a leather bench. Wouldn't that be cool to see somewhere? Um, or, or here's a, an example of a bench that's not very comfortable at all. I don't know, uh, that designer did not take that into effect. Um, what's next? Convivial. Um, it literally means welcoming, and this bench says it right on it, or this bench is designed, you know, to have people sit closer to each other and a nice backrest, and, and this is Central Park in New York, right? It's a, it's a classic safe, functional, and budget bench, but just the manner in which they're, they're uh, designed and laid out um, it encourages you to interact with passersby and, and otherwise. Um, convivial in all hours of the day, in all seasons of the year. This one has lights at night. And then fun is the top of the pyramid. Uh, you know, how do we challenge ourselves to get beyond the safe and functional and get to something that's fun and engaging, or, or we would say that has, that it contains a surprise and delight. So this bench actually lights up when you touch it. Um, here you go, Notre Dame, right? Moose cross bench, people, you know, dress them up for winter, take selfies next to them, and otherwise that's a fun bench. Um, this bench spins around um, when you sit on it. I keep asking somebody if maybe they could um, uh, make a bench that has uh, xylophone slats in it. Wouldn't that be fun to, to ding on those? But, but my team did make me a fun bench one point in time. Uh, that's myself and our uh, skill trades manager, Nick. And so they said, hey, we, we finally made you a fun bench. This, this is just an example, um, but this could be applied in a lot of things. And so you'll, you'll hear us ask a lot of times, you know, where is the fun? And you know, as, as uh, I know your group would, would be very interested in that. And, and you're going to be stuck in boardroom meetings or in uh, organizational planning meetings and otherwise. And you're often, um, you know, spending so much time around uh, the form and fashion or, or, or safety or budget, but you forget to work your way up the rest of the pyramid. Uh, I've copywritten a framework called the experience framework that, that we use quite a bit. Um, and it, it looks a little something like this. What it does is it, it's kind of a function of the sum of programmatic, uh, promotional, and physical experiences. I'll explain what each one of those are and how they work together and their scale of emotional response, positively or negatively influenced exponentially by um, people's historical context, uh, whatever that, their, their historical experiences. And so, um, let me explain each one of these, a promotional experience. What's a promotional experience? Well, um, that, that could be all of the things you encounter before you actually get to whatever it is that we're offering. So if we're talking about our Performing Arts Center, right, that might be our social media campaigns, our billboards, our radio ads, our website, you know, our flyers, and things like that, um, our logos, and, and, and all of those types of, our swag, right, that's a promotional side. Um, the scale of emotional response um, could be very transparent there in, in the lighter blue or or very positive and so that uh, we all can think about what a negative promotion might look like uh, it just it doesn't go well it doesn't go over well it's bad design uh, it just misses the mark on, on an advertising side of things so that kind of makes sense the promotional leaf there the programmatic 
um, would be it, it's whatever it is you're actually offering. So if you're a restaurant, it's your food and your your customer your service, right? If you're um, uh, in an amusement park, it, it's your your roller coaster, right? <laughs> um, it's it's whatever it is that you're actually celebrating. It's the program. And then um, the physical aspect is all the things you you touch, you see, you smell, you you feel, um, you hear, and and so. Um, we, we could think about a bad physical environment, going back to our performing arts center example, right? The, the program is the concert, the promotional elements, we talked about that. The physical is the actual theater itself. Um, and, and we could think about what, what it looks like if it's not very well taken care of, or if it's really, you know, contributing at a high level. And so these things have this kind of intersection uh, that's really critical when they're all performing at an optimal range um, is when we can encounter what we would would ideally want to see from our end users a positive emotional response. Uh, and all these things have to uh, work together. Uh, there's no such thing, at least not sustainably, um, where you could have really, really great promotions and, and a terrible program and, and be uh, a high functioning organization um, that you, people would call your bluff pretty quick. You know, whatever you, you could have this great, you know, web campaign and, and all these wonderful promises on, on your billboards and your, your radio commercials, and people show up and the, the, the event actually stinks. <laughs> um, so you can kind of see how all of these have to push and pull together. Um, and that positive emotional response we think is so important because of uh, something that we, we talk about called continue continuum of engagement. And I'm sorry, we're getting a little academic here. I know you guys just finished finals, but um, we've already talked about a function and we saw a Venn diagram and, and now a bell curve, right? But um, some of this stuff really is, uh, I think it's important to think about it because a lot of times the the, the work we do, um, particularly when we're talking about placemaking and event planning and otherwise, that people think it's um, just fun and games. Um, but when we apply some of these frameworks and business models to what we do, it starts to make a lot more sense. Um, this continuum of engagement, when we have um, a, a group of folks that you might survey at any given time in any organization, they could be plotted on this continuum of engagement and invariably it'll start to look something like this. Uh, most people, um, right, if you look at the, the standard distribution, most people end up in the center of this bell curve. Um, what do you think about uh, your city that you live in, for example? Most people will be somewhat neutral, eh, you know, South Bend, it's a good place to live, you raise a family here, you know, whatever the case may be. The, the weather could be a little better or this or schools or whatever, you know, potholes, right? Whatever it might be, but most people are, are fall right there in the middle of this, this um, continuum. There's some people that are on the far end of it that are hostile or angry, um, they're always posting on the message boards. I, I don't even know why they live here. I you know, kind of want to give them a bus ticket to move. <laughs> and then there's people on the exact opposite end that are just so committed and in love with the community. They're always volunteering. Um, they're at the events. They're, they're engaging with their, their uh, natural and built environment. And uh, those are the folks that, that make a community really a, a, a place worth living. Um, well, when we go back to that uh, experience framework, remember the center, was positive emotional engagement. When we hit positive emotional engagement on the head, we can shift, we have the ability to shift this continuum of engagement. Um, it doesn't mean the haters are all, all of a sudden gonna become lovers. Now that's kind of rose colored picture, but I always say, can we get the, the folks that are hostile to become a little bit more bored? And can you get the people that are bored to become a little more curious, curious, engaged, committed, love? And you shape the, um, the, the future of that community forever. Um, we actually asked about this in a citywide survey a couple of years ago. Um, we had a statistically valid survey uh, distributed throughout the entire community, Spanish, English, um, all income brackets were covered, all uh, neighborhoods were covered, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and and it, we charted it and it came out somewhat like this. If I were to normalize it, you know, it kind of looks like that bell curve, right? Um, I was encouraged to note that um, you know, it was skewed a little bit more towards the east or the right side of this curve. Um, there, there's more lovers than haters, right? <laughs> so um, it's pretty neat. And it'll be fun to track that over time. Um, unfortunately, last year during the pandemic, we didn't quite get a good reading on this one, but uh, we, we'll, we'll do it again this summer and, and see where we come out with. Um, 
So uh, a part of this um, process when we're looking at uh, designing a place like Howard Park, for example, um, but I, I would argue that that any major project we're doing um, in, in business, um, in community development, in, in any organization should involve processes like this. And, and what I mean by that, um, if you can't tell what this is, uh, just by looking at it, I'm guessing you could, but this is what we'll call stakeholder engagement. Uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of sessions, um, thousands of hours of uh, and thousands of pieces of community input. Um, we went out to festivals and asked people to draw, you know, what did you like about your neighborhood parks or what would you like to see? We're thinking about redoing the river walk. Um, we had uh, surveying tools. We had national benchmarks that we looked at. Um, we actually even found out, I put a picture which you see down in the bottom right corner of that soccer team. Um, this is a Spanish speaking soccer league that uh, plays at a park that we call Pulaski Park. And, and we knew we wanted to redo Pulaski in a big way. It was a park that was well deserving of some upgrades. And we just weren't getting the resident feedback that, that we wanted from that park. People just weren't commenting on Pulaski Park. And we, we thought it's interesting, you know, we've been putting posters out in Spanish and English and the surveys are, are you know, the call in numbers are in Spanish and English. Um, we even had some meetings on the west side of town near where this park is, and but we still weren't getting feedback. So one of our partners actually joined the soccer league. He, he's a Spanish speaker himself and joined the soccer league and started forging relationships. Um, we took it very seriously to try and get that um, kind of input that was necessary um, to help shape uh, how our parks and, and these big programs looked. Uh, we even put these yard signs. Um, uh, we, we won a, um, a really neat uh, grant from Code for America for, the, for the, our efforts behind this. Um, but we put these yard signs out and said, how would you make this property better? And you just call in and then we would be able to um, kind of put that feedback in, into some meaningful action steps. And so um, I mentioned data um, that during the planning process of, of all these park upgrades, um, we went through and, and did all kinds of, um, you know, if, if the, the feedback or the resident engagement is the objective side, we really wanted some subjective measures as well. And so uh, we partnered with the Trust for Public Land to map out our entire city and uh, what we see here is park access. Um, what, what it looks like is if it's, if it's green, um, these people live within a 10 minute walk of a park. As you get more pale yellow, orange, and red would be the worst places. It almost could be defined as a park desert. Um, they're more than a mile and a half away from the nearest park. And so as we're making investments, it was really important for us to have the equity conversation top of mind. Yeah, we can put this really, really great park somewhere, but what about some of the neighborhoods that don't even have parks to begin with? And so that was important to us. Um, and, and then we took a quality analysis of every single park. We did something called the uh, GRASS program. It's a um, PhD student out of North Carolina called Geo Reference Amenities Standards Program. And, and she wrote her whole thesis on this. And we were one of the first cities in the country to use it. Um, but it took a, a quality inventory analysis of all the assets in our park system and uh, geospatially mapped them uh, as it relates to quality. It gave each um, park a score. And um, what we ended up doing though, is taking that, those grass scores, those quality scores, overlaying it with our trust for public land access maps, we get something like this. Um, it's really hard to tell what's going on here, but the larger the circle, the more quality the park is, the smaller the circle, it means that park needs some work. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting when we say, we see something like this, I zoom in a little bit, um, these larger circles mean it, it's a quality park again, smaller, um, or we're not so proud of it. And so I look over on the far right of the screen, and this is the uh, far east side of, of South Bend. And, and we, we have this kind of park desert area um, there, the red and, and orange area. And then, so they're far away, they don't have a park nearby, but the closest park they do have is a crappy park. And so that told us, here's a neighborhood where we've got to do a lot of work, right? Um, so we went through and scoped all our projects and, and looked at major upgrades, um, athletic fields and courts, pavilions, playgrounds, restrooms. We upgraded every single restroom in our, sit in our system. Um, each None of these restrooms were previously um, ADA compliant or, or otherwise. So we wanted to make sure, again, we were touching every part of the city. And, and it was important during this process that we communicated this back out to the community. Um, so we developed a special website called My SB Parks and Trails where people could go in and, and look at 
um, their neighborhood parks and what projects did we have proposed for those parks. And we gave each one a score um, based on what I would call our impact drivers. And so this one um, is about, uh, we, we subjectively rated these on how is it going to improve equity in our in this in this park and so um, I forget the color scale here right now and I don't think I have the legend uh, available dynamically to pull down on the top right but basically this said hey this is helping improve access it's improving connectivity it's it's um, improving something on ADA um, it is uh, adding an amenity to a neighborhood park that has historically been un underserved um, that would improve the equity mission. Um, ecology, um, the bigger the bubble, the, the more um, we had geared towards ecological stewardship. So that could be um, invasive species management, that could be stormwater offsets or, or um, uh, tree canopy coverage, improving the tree canopy coverage. Um, how did it improve the neighborhoods, economic impacts? Um, this was really important to us too, that parks aren't just um, things that, that are, are fun and games and, and swing sets, right? Um, we, we did a study with the Chamber of Commerce that showed that um, the Howard Park project had about $120 million worth of economic impact in the, in the immediate neighborhood at a shot, snapshot in time, not to mention the increased property values, increased business traffic, so on and so forth. And so it's really fun to look at, you know, things like that. And, um, and, and, and of course, public safety. Uh, so uh, moving on here, um, the, the whole program we put together was called My SB Parks and Trails. We, we again, we would call it My SB because this was informed by the community, those thousands of pieces of, of resident feedback. And so um, each one of these asterisks represents a, a project that we did. Um, some of them were very large scale, like the Charles Black Center that got a four and a half million dollar renovation. It's one of our community centers in um, what I would call an economically distressed uh, portion of the, the city. Uh, we added a bike shop, an art studio, a commercial kitchen, uh, a stage. We added two basketball courts, a uh, music studio, if I didn't say that, a gym, fitness center, uh, really enhanced the space um, for all of the users. And it's a really intergenerational facility. You'll have seniors and youth and after school programming that are excited about that. I mentioned uh, the restrooms and park. We, we did, um, I think it was 22 different neighborhood parks and restroom projects. And so lots of groundbreakings. And um, we, we worked on our golf course uh, clubhouses. Um, golf was an interesting topic because historically golf's a declining sport. And, and um, in South Bend, we wanted to make sure we had more access um, to our golf course properties beyond the sport of golf. And so uh, this is a old historic barn that we, um, restored back to community banquet space. It was just used for a golf course clubhouse. And so we wanted to cross utilize our golf courses. This is an interesting uh, um, project called Boomer. Um, this is a, a really dynamic mobile kind of stage, video screen, audio system, interactive touch screen on the back. Um, what we wanted to do was increase uh, the kind of amenities that we had available to have in all of our neighborhood parks, but we knew we couldn't have a theater or a, a rock wall or a splash pad or ice skating rink in every single park. We have 62 properties, right? Um, it, it, we knew that would be tough, but we thought, what if we had something that would rotate around to all the parks that was really dynamic and, and, and very relevant? You know, it's, it's got Wi-Fi on board and, and again, that interactivity. And, and, and when people came, they couldn't help but want to come out there. And, it, you know, what we thought of when we were designing this was the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, right? When people see that, they, they want to go take a selfie with it. They want to go up to it, and, and it's a spectacle to behold. Um, whether or not you know anything about what's going on around that Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, you want to go see it. Its reputation precedes it. So guess what we did? We hired the exact same company that designed the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile in Fasttown, North Carolina, and they designed us this um really dynamic experience that we call boomer looks like a boom box and so um it, the, the whole uh idea here is that we could um enhance our equity and relevancy kind of scores throughout the community with this uh mobile experiential unit and so that's part of our team there uh you see restored a historic fountain uh history was really important history i just put this slide in here to, to underscore the fact that um, we, we didn't just tear down everything and upgrade everything. We, history was really important to us uh, in that we preserved things wherever we could. And in this instance, worked with the community group of volunteers who actually found this fountain that was 
um, basically thought to have disappeared from the city. Uh, it turns out it was in somebody's backyard uh, through a series of, I don't have time to go into the story now, but through a series of interesting um, uh, misfortunes uh, for the fountain, um, it, it ended up in somebody's backyard. And, and But luckily we were able to find it, restore it and, and put it in one of our parks. And so I, I mentioned we did all of this without raising any taxes or implementing any new taxes. And here's just a little way uh, in which we funded it. Uh, again, I won't go into the financing tools right now, but um, there, there's a great website that, that we keep up to date called myspparksandtrails.com that shows you all these projects, how we financed them um, and some of the philosophies behind them. So with that said, I'm, I'm finally to Howard Park. And um, I think some of you are probably familiar with Howard Park because that's what you asked me to talk about. Um, and, and how we got here is pretty interesting. It's, it was our city's very first park, but, but before it was a park, I mean, um, the city of South Bend was, was home to the Pokagon Band of the Potawatomi Indian. This was native land, uh, right? And um, at, shortly after European settlement, uh, it became, the river was such a critical part of, of you know, traversing, um, particularly the Midwest and, and Southeast for Native Americans. Um, but then European settlement came along and it became uh, a major uh, you know, commerce route. Uh, for fur trading and otherwise, and South Bend was was no different. Um, it came known first as um, Big so St. Joseph Station, eventually South Bend. We were situated on the southern bend of the St. Joseph River. It, fun fact for you, in South Bend, the river actually right at Howard Park starts to turn and actually flows north. One of the few rivers in the world that flows north and it ends up in Lake Michigan. So. Um, after European settlement, it didn't take long for the Industrial Revolution to start to set in. And this is what a riverfront looks like. Um, it became a, a conveyor belt for industry. Uh, it's what powered our, our uh, fact, factories and, and manufacturing. Uh, it's what thrust us into really um, manufacturing fame throughout the world. And uh, not only was it a source of power, but it also became the dump. And um, this is what our riverfront starts to look like um, around the turn of the century, early uh, 1900s. Well, that's what Howard Park is. It, it's the city dump. Um, that at one point in time, uh, the river was the dividing point uh, in town for uh, South Bend. And so um, it, the other town was called Lowell. And so South Bend would ship its trash over to Lowell. And the first piece of property you got to was Howard, what we know as Howard Park. And so um, there was a, um, city councilman and, and local attorney by the name of Tim Howard um, that came up with this idea of plotting that land. Uh, there's a picture of old Tim. Um, and uh, turning it into, uh, taking out the refuse and um, uh, turning it into what was called a pleasure ground. Uh, this was in 1878. These are the actual minutes from that city council meeting. Um, that this, this city dump um, where it was filled with um, mosquitoes and, and um, all kinds of trash deposits, he wanted to, he had this vision to turn it into a pleasure ground, a public pleasure ground. Uh, that term is not a term I don't think we would use today, but it, but it illustrates how innovative South Bend really was and, and, and always has been. Um, the the um, word public park was not in the vernacular. Uh, there was no such thing. There were there were community gar there were gardens and plazas and piazzas and town squares, but no parks. There were um, athletic fields, but pleasure grounds is what they first were known as. And so, um, it, when we redid the park, you know, we were history buffs and we thought maybe we call it Howard's Pleasure Ground, but that quickly got voted down. <laughs> um, this is what it looked like, um, how it developed through the years um, in its early track. There's the dump. Um, Here's the earliest rendition of the park. It opened in 1899, um, just not much more than a series of trails and otherwise the, the seawall going up as part of a, a WPA era project. Um, I always laugh at this photo. Here's the, the three guys in suits overseeing the, the, the two guys working. Um, but uh, you can see industry in the background um, and Howard Park really starts to take shape. That historic fountain that I mentioned was actually installed in Howard Park originally. We, uh, when we unearthed it and, and restored it, we put it um, up the river at Leaper Park, but kind of interesting. So you get some good views of Howard Park here uh, through the history. Um, in the 1950s, uh, an ice skating rink was installed in the community center. And so that was open and lots of memories made there through the years. Um, 
and uh, you kind of see what Howard Park ended up being um, in its modern form before we totally redeveloped it. This is what it looked like um, uh, it, about uh, two and a half years ago uh, before we basically scraped the entire park and started over. The ice skating rink had reached its end of the useful life. The community center was falling apart, the parking lot, the, the grass. It was just um, a park that was, I would say, very tired um, is a compliment. <laughs> And so we went through these community planning processes um, that, that, again, were, were very exhaustive, um, more in depth than, than anything we've seen before. There you can see uh, Mayor Buttigieg um, helping lead one of the sessions. Um, we developed this whole framework uh, for the entire riverfront and made Howard Park a high priority site. Our city's very first park, centrally located, great real estate right on the river. Um, worked together with a, a whole host of incredible partners from around the country. Um, Ambient Energy out of uh, Colorado, we, we became a lead V4 certified building. A Lakota Group out of Chicago, Stantec out of Minneapolis, Crystal Fountains out of Toronto, um, Alliance Architect is a lead, they're based in South Bend and, and some of our other partners there as well. Um, as we redeveloped it, and this, is, this was I think one of the most important um, things we did was we, we put into place our guiding principles. Um, and it, it was these four things you see on your screen here. Steward th stewardship through operational efficiency, nature as a model, inclusivity, and surprise and delight. Um, e each one of these had bullet points underneath them. I, I won't read them all to you now, but um, making sure that we understood what each one of these things meant. And, and what happened was um, that when we bumped up against hard decisions during the design process with all of our partners and our staff, uh, we would go back to our guiding principles to help make sure um, we were doing the right thing and doing right by the project. And so it, it made the project even more special. So uh, we engaged with, um, these are some of our partners and some of our planning meetings. Um, it was really critical that we were using, I think this particular one, we were talking about landscaping and, and native plants and, and whatnot. We, we installed 30,000 uh, native trees and plants in the park. Uh, this is us with our brainstorming hats on, uh, just a hat collection of mine that I uh, tended to uh, ask people to wear as we started visioning the park and walking through it and whatnot. Just a couple of our staff members and park board members. Um, and so uh, we, we did a lot of dreaming. Uh, these are these are sheets I put together that that um, we call them inspirations or aspirations. And so uh, for all the different areas, which was so important because as we were envisioning these spaces, um, you know, it, it can't just happen overnight, right? You, you've got to let some of these things marinate and start to look at um, uh, precedent images and, and other projects in the community and um, and, and throughout the world, really. Um, I think we, we counted at one point in time, this park was influenced by no fewer than 28 different uh, parks throughout different uh, cities in, in the world. Um, so you can, it was really important to us that we were, were taking some of the best things that, that we were aware of and applying them to the park. In fact, our, um, our staff, um, here's some of our early doodles and, and whatnot. So uh, started, it, these things just start out as doodles and, and the shapes and forms start to come into place. And so that was really important. And how do people get in and out of the park? And you literally start doing crowd um, analysis and, and, and saying, okay, what if, what if we move the parking lot here? What if we didn't even have a parking lot and we shared parking with the neighbors and widen the street to put parking on there. And, you know, these things started getting wacky and eventually it shapes up. I think this was one of the final concepts we had and, and we start, doing all kinds of modeling and, and saying, okay, well, this is great. We want to put the playground inside our ice trail. Can, can we do that? Well, well, then what if, you know, this type of thing, these questions, well, what if you want to play on the playground while the ice trails, you can't walk across the ice, right? Well, well what if we put a tunnel in here and, and a bridge, you, you could ice skate on a bridge um, and, and then walk into the playground. Well, can we refrigerate a bridge? Well, it turns out we're the first place in the world that ever refrigerated an ice bridge. Um, and so we asked a lot of what if questions and going through the process. Um, during the middle of all this, we experienced a, a thousand year flood. Um, statistically, uh, this type of flood would only happen once every 1000 years. This is Howard Park. So we had to go back and redesign and make sure we were accommodating uh, potential floods. And, and you know, uh, we're, we're seeing um, storm and seawater rise happening even in cities like South Bend. Um, you don't think about that, but but it was critical. And so we had to redesign some of our, our thought processes. 
I mentioned uh, benchmarking. And so we're going out here. Here's a group of the staff and, and we went to Chicago and Valparaiso and Elkhart and um, benchmark some of the, the great projects that we thought were around. I uh, was fortunate enough to go up and, and participate in a session in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan um, in January, right? Uh, if you, you don't know where that is, it's, um, I think it's about as far north as you want to go in Canada before it's really only bears. Um, here was uh, the wind chill uh, when I was up there that particular day. I took a screenshot was negative 53 Celsius, negative 63 Fahrenheit. Um, it was chilly up there, but this was, I, I kid you not, it was bike to work week when I was there during this. And so what we were studying is how some of the, the coldest and darkest uh, winter cities in the world are, are some of the most happy happiest places um, and, and most economically thriving winter cities. And so um, the idea is um, how do you introduce, um, this was Norman Pressman who I got to meet up there. Um, how do you introduce small scale interventions and incremental responses um, and policy and design that make your, your winter city more livable? And so um, it, I took it as a challenge that says, yeah, you can't tell people they have to uh, like winter we have to create a city, a winter city they want to like. So that's what we did with Howard Park. Um, it, there was all kinds of um, um, information and sessions and speakers on, on uh, the benefits of uh, a winter city in terms of uh, health and wellness, equity, economic, ec ecology, kind of, kind of similar to our impact drivers. Um, one fascinating thing I liked uh, that somebody applied, one of the speakers was talking about this 880 city movement. Uh, the idea that, that this is really interesting as you talk about design and otherwise the idea that if you can design a city or an attraction or amenity that is um, accessible and exciting um, and, and enjoyable or uh, for an eight-year-old as it is accessible exciting and enjoyable for an 80 year old you're going to hit everybody uh, we, we talk about that quite often and so we applied to the project these winter um, winter city design guidelines um, and, and so this is what howard park starts to shape up to be um, for those of you that haven't visited, I'd highly recommend it. It's hard to explain it uh, with just pictures and maps, but um, we've got uh, the most unique ice skating experience in the world. And, and I don't, I, I tend to get excited about my city and speak in, in uh, superlatives, but this is true. The combination of our ice pond and our ice trail, which has undulations, you skate uphill and downhill slightly over an ice refrigerated ice bridge, the first one in the world around near fire pits. And we've got our, uh, um, South Bend chocolate, hot chocolate stand, and, and it's just an incredible experience. The public art, the, um, the event lawns, the interactive fountains that, that shoot 20 feet into the air, taller than the building. We've got a bar and restaurant out in the park. And so uh, bocce courts, uh, four seasons worth of programming um, that were really important for us to um, uh, think through well in advance, you know. And so this is us um, doing some experiential mapping. We went to our convention center actually after we had the designs done, but before we started construction, we we taped out the entire floor of the convention center to say, hey, this is this is how people will walk through the park and this is where they will, will park and this is how they'll check out their skates. And, and we we gamified it and, and went through this entire kind of journey map, um, both on paper and physically to say, hey, you know, what if we just moved this over here or added this over there? What if we had heaters or, or you know, why people are waiting in line? And, and so it made it a much more, um, a, a, you know, fruitful project. And, and meanwhile, we, um, as a staff, we read different articles and books and, and shared things with our project team, a few of them there that um, I would highly recommend. Um, Palaces for the People that talks about, um, uh, again, how uh, parks and uh, pu shared public spaces um, you know, increase equity and safety in, in neighborhoods, uh, art of relevance, uh, for the love of city, Peter Cagliano, a, a, a friend and, and mentor of mine, um, talks about co-creating the communities and pixels in place, challenging us to think about, um, how people not only encounter the physical world these days, but they have these digital devices with them everywhere they go. And, and what does that look like and how do they interact? So, um, we shut down the, um, the ice rink in the park and everything that had been there and, and, had the project team going a big uh, groundbreaking um, and I, I won't go through I'm just going to click through these really fast um, some of the photos of the construction project um, all local labor um, again local materials it's a lead version four certified uh, project um, we, we've got um, over 
the carpentry, the, the skilled labor, I can't speak enough about um, how talented everybody was. That there's me, remember that picture earlier where the supervisors were overseeing the crew? There's, there's me doing the same. Um, it's an incredible amount of work uh, that, that came into play. But you can see the park starting to shape up. We had fun with the, the contractors too. We had some cookouts. We brought them popsicles in, in, in the heat of summer. Uh, really neat, uh, again, historical things that we were able to work back into the design. There are over 12 miles of refrigerated piping under the ice trail um, that keep it cold. And, and so we can have ice uh, for roughly from Thanksgiving to St. Patrick's Day um all of the infrastructure that that goes in to make the fountains and the playgrounds and everything work um as an old high school friend that I, I i ran into on the job um some of the art projects and involved youth and community members and creating um some of the pieces that you see in the park right before we were scheduled to open it, we got a huge snow um and the contractor out there that's actually me serving hot chocolate the backpack hot chocolate and so we wanted to keep our team motivated this is a community park right and so um all the plantings coming in that's that's the only time they ever let me drive the zamboni machine before there was actually ice we laid ice you paint the ice um it, you know we we funded this we thanked our community partners half of this project it was about 20 million dollar project half of it was funded um from non-taxpayer dollars so grants partnerships and individual donations and so we're so grateful for those folks um and we started doing a lot of promotions uh finished up a ton of projects citywide uh, meanwhile, it was a busy year, but roughly in, in, in one year's time, um, the park went from this to this. Um, I'll show you that one more time. From this, we, we scraped essentially the entire park to this. Um, it's winning all kinds of awards nationwide. Almost immediately after we opened, Midwest Living Magazine named it uh, one of the top five places you had to visit uh, that winter. Um, you can see the playground inside the intergenerational experiences, the, uh, again, everything's high tech. Um, you can rent your locker with your credit card and there's cell phone chargers in there and Instagrammable moments throughout the park. Um, we celebrated Tim Howard, Timothy Howard, uh, when we reopened and used his same, um, phrase that he said at the original grand opening, uh, we repeated that and we think it was just as relevant, uh, at the grand opening in 2019 as it was back in 1899. This park has now become an ornament to the city and a place of delight for all our people, for all our people. Remember we talked about inclusivity, right? We talked about surprise. It was just great to work that in there. Um, some really neat stories from opening night. I, I, you know, I'm running out of time, so I won't share all of those, but just some pictures of, of um, how the park has, has really unwrapped and um, there's the ribbon cutting and the fire pits and, um, this was our our kind of grand opening. I mentioned the uh, the bar and restaurant there. This is a neat business model. We talk about environmental sustainability, and, and I mentioned LEED certified and the solar panels and, and some of those things. All the stormwater is managed on site, but we also have a, a business that we built into the the facility, and, and that helps support the ongoing operations and, and maintenance of the park. And so. Um, we have these uh, ski sleds for, for folks that would be in wheelchairs or otherwise. Um, and uh, here's just some views. These are the fountains. These are in interactive mode, so kids can play in them. But when they're in show mode, again, they go like 20 feet in the air. So um, some of the indoor office spaces and whatnot. Oh, uh, Olympic gold medalist Brian Boitano uh, came out and helped us uh, uh, introduce it and so uh, introduce the, the park itself. So that's Howard Park in a nutshell. Um, it, it is it's really been a privilege to work on that project, but. But we didn't stop there. I mean, you know, obviously I mentioned the pandemic hit. We were in the midst of a campaign called Hit Refresh right now. You can see some visuals of that. We're trying to just help remind people that uh, businesses are still open and, and um, the community is, is reopening and, and there's kind of that double entendre that we're combating this kind of seasonal apathy and that, that, that kind of sets in in the spring, but also uh, this idea that we are ready to, to hit refresh and start over um, after the pandemic. Um, another project we're working on that is just about the size and scale of, of Howard. It's called Sites Park and the Associated River Walk. Um, I won't, you know, we'll, we'll do this presentation again another time and I'll show you all of it once it's complete, but you can see um, here's the first class riverfront that's happening right downtown um, and the Associated Park uh, totally surrounded. It's essentially an island uh, by water and, and a performance pavilion out there. Uh, it's where you uh, get your tickets to go whitewater rafting right in the heart of the city. Uh, and then the South Bend River lights are there as well. And so some new river walk projects throughout town. 
Uh, we're going to continue to upgrade uh, the river lights experience. And so if you haven't seen the river lights, um, again, uh, just an incredible project that um, it's, it's, uh, it's actually the world's first interactive display of light over a body of water. So you play this game where you can throw light from the east side of the river to the west, the west side of the river. This is a throw when you do your arms like this, and this is a catch. Um, and so we govern the colors, right? But, you know, um, it, during 4th of July, you're throwing red, white, just blues back and forth. And, and uh, during uh, Christmas, reds and greens and, and uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, greens and orange. And, and when Notre Dame wins, we, we turn it blue and gold. And when Notre Dame loses, we just shut it off. Kidding, you don't really do that, but um, we're going to be enhancing and adding some more uh, experiences along the River Lights Trail yet this summer. Um, we just announced our 100th anniversary of the Morris Performing Arts Center, our 2,500 uh, seat theater that had Broadway shows and, and comedians and, and rock and, and, and hip hop and, and you name it, children's shows. Um, we announced a $30 million project there to expand the building. Uh, redo the plaza, add some additional parking and otherwise. And so here's a look at some of those um, and how we're gonna um, do that. We extended our contract with the uh, South Bend Cubs, um, an affiliate of the Chicago Cubs uh, for an additional 20 years and, and announced the an addition of an upper deck uh, to the stadium. Uh, our zoo, we're, we're uh, in the midst right now of adding giraffes. Those will be here, I think later this summer um, if everything go stays on, on uh, schedule. Uh, so we're excited about those. Uh, we just added an esports arena at our convention center, really one of the most dynamic ones in the country. That the only thing that can parallel it is, I think, in um, there's one in Texas and one in Pennsylvania. Um, but it, it, the, the future of esports, we think, um, is, is is bright, and so uh, we're looking forward to getting a piece of that four billion dollar a year industry here in South Bend. So. Um, that's what who we are, uh, how we work, and and the things we've been up to. So um, it's always fun to again uh, share those the why behind what we do um, with folks that are that are particularly interested in it. So um, thanks for letting me spend spend some time talking you through it. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Aaron. That's awesome. Like I, I have been to Howard Park a couple times. I was fortunate enough to uh skate uh, over the winter and i my god i was blown away when i first saw it but the planning that's gone behind it is even more inspiring and motivational to what can be done uh that's yeah thank you so much it's been really eye-opening to see that i think it's just awesome yeah that stuff's really important and it, what's it's what makes the, the the stakeholder engagement the the you know the all the planning little little tweaks and things you do along the way i mean you guys are experiencing that in the work that you're doing with, you know, well, heck, look at what's right behind you, Caitlin. Like, <laughs> um, all that stuff is, is just a, a really important part of, of the process and what ensures a successful project. I think people sometimes take those shortcuts and um, it, it shows. So. Definitely. so how'd you do on skating? Could you feel the uphill, <laughs> downhill? <laughs> I Oh, I sure did. Yeah. The, I love that little downhill and over the bridge. That's yeah. Yeah, how did they do that? What was uh, was it difficult to get it yeah, over carp the bridge? Carpenters, I mean, the carpenters, you know, you have to work at low. I mean, you can drive over bridges anywhere, right? But like, you had to really design it to accommodate the the freezing, uh, which you know, the all the pipes and everything like that. And um, you, you want it to be safe, you, you know, ice skating and, and come around that corner and, and you're going downhill. You, you don't want anybody falling over the bridge. So there's a lot of nuances that went into it, but we thought that was going to be really critical once we came up with the idea of like, Hey, this is, this is how you can access the playground. Kids love this experience, right? The playground's open all winter. You, you go under the bridge, people are skating above you. It's a great selfie spot, you know? Um, and that's probably the other thing too, is like the training that goes into staff, like they're, they're it's designed um, for the staff to come out. If our skate guards are going around, they notice you taking a picture, they'll come up to you and ask you, Hey, can, can we take a picture for you? You know, those types of things. So uh, I know some of you guys study Disney and, and whatnot. And so we try to throw some of those elements in there as well. Awesome. Yeah. I think it's super cool that, uh, that I feel like a lot of people who are designing this might try to go the way of, oh, well, we'll make the like, we'll have the kids walk over a bridge. Like it's much easier to design a bridge to the playground. But the fact that you guys stuck with the refrigerated or, or the frozen bridge for the ice skating rink was very cool. I also got to go on the ice rink. And as someone who doesn't know how to skate, very well. Um, the the downhill part was a lot of fun because that was the only time I got to pick up speed. So, so that was a lot of fun. 
Yeah, that's the best part. You can coast, right? <laughs> yeah, we're the only the third. Um, we're only the third one in the country uh, that has that those undulations. Um, there's one in Spokane, Washington, and one in Chicago. Um, so, but the, um, only the second one that has the those those trails have a uh, a little bit of limitation, right? Because you can't take lessons on the trails, really. That's kind of hard to do. You can't play any kind of like hockey type sport on there, broom ball or anything. Um, it, it's hard to do. You can't do any figure skating on there or practice, you know. So we wanted that trail uh, pond, what we call the ice pond combo. Um, and so we're only the second place that's done something like that. And, and the ice bridge and the fire pit, like all of these things, the whole combination, again, it, it's, it's something you won't find anywhere else. So, but it'll only be a matter of time, right? Until so somebody else wants to do something like this. And, and just like we were benchmarking places and tried to add our element to it, somebody else is going to do this too. And um, I think that's the, the part that's exciting is that this is it's a breathing project. It, we're not done. Like we're going to keep adding things and changing things and programmatically evolving it. Sure, we're probably not going to change the, the shape of the ice or anything anytime soon, but how do we... Um, maintain relevancy um, as this thing kind of um, starts to age. And that'll be the challenge for the staff to keep up on. That great book, and just to I'll put a plug in too, is called The Art of Relevancy um, that, that we read as a team. So. Well, I actually have a question for you about, about the presentation, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I really like the philosophy of, his name was Chester, I believe, the, the character yeah. from the book. Um, I guess one question I had is like during your time working in the um, the Parks Association, what what has made people turn their heads? I guess like what features um, have you seen that that like most make people realize uh, the you know how good South Bend is and and makes them come to them? Yeah, I think um, well that's where we came up with that term and, and and adapted the term. I don't think we're the first ones to ever use it. Surprise and delight, like mm -hmm. we. It, but it's not enough just to do these things. Um, you have to tell people about them. Like, right. you know, it, we can put the ice trail in, but if we're not actually telling people and, and reiterating like, hey, this is this one national gold medal award and this, you know, you're the only place in the world that has this, you know, type thing. And uh, making sure people are sharing pictures on social media and it just gets repeatable type thing. And then people start to, to notice. Um, one of the interesting um uh, kind of um, philosophies when you're designing a destination um, is that w I, I did think, even though I, I mentioned Chester at the beginning, um, and we're trying to get Chester to turn his head around, if I designed for Chester, I probably wouldn't get Chester to turn his head around. I got to design for somebody that's 60, 90, 120, you know, uh, 600 miles away that when they come here, they get excited. You know, they go, wow, this is the... Like, if I can get that person to notice us, Chester will invariably come on board. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes that um, that credibility comes from folks from outside of your own city looking in and taking a peek under the hood. So, yeah. Do the Notre Dame football games help with that at all, or are most people like pretty honed in on the games when they come into town? Yeah, no. I mean, Notre Dame football games really help. Um, they get you know it's tough because there's no hotel rooms when football games happen. So what are we doing? It's, it's challenging to bring in extra shows or do extra festivals and conference conventions, things like that around when there's football season, but we want to make sure our, our city shines. And, and it's, it's fun to even see not only from the um, 60, 80,000 plus people that come to town on, on football weekends, but even what um, being on national TV does those six Saturdays a year and, and being able to work with the university and NBC to come out and, and film the gold and blue river lights or when there's a green out in the stadium we turn them green the night before and then that's on tv the next day <laughs> you can't buy media like that right <laughs> and so that's a huge billboard for south bend um it's so uh, yeah, absolutely and, and we want to you know i think about public places as um indicator species right like you know often you'll talk about uh if you see a butterfly here that probably indicates you know, a healthy ecosystem, you know, type thing. Well, if, if somebody's coming into our town that's never been here before and sees nice trails, nice parks, um, you, you know, nice wayfinding signage, public art, things like that, um, they're going to have a perception of South Bend 
that's different than if they just drove through and and didn't get the nice welcome to South Bend sign, didn't see the, you know, it's an indicator species of a thriving community. And so even that stuff, even if you don't stop in our parks, you're going to think about South Bend in one way, shape or form based on what you experience even from your, your drive or walk through the community. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for answering my question. That was very interesting. I have another question too. I noticed, yeah, because you graduated from Notre Dame and have lived in South Bend all your life. I think that's really cool and amazing that you're really giving back to the community. What was your undergrad? Because I'm personally just a bit inspired and wondering <laughs> what you would need to yeah. do something like this. Yeah, um, undergrad, I was FTT. So film, television, and theater. Um, had some design classes too and whatnot. So um, I, I always look for people that have kind of that design thinking or um, that, that, that becomes critical to these, these things. But then I always joke, I, I had to go back and get the pragmatic degree. So I went back for my MBA <laughs> as well. And, and, but, you know, it's pretty neat to be able, you, you got to um, scratch both sides of that itch in your brain. You know, you've got the, the creative side and, and uh, that helps you be able to think through the design elements, but then you also got to apply the business acumen or the, the political, you know, science, you, you know, levers to make sure you can get this through uh, city council or, or any, other uh, municipal like processes and whatnot. So um, it's, it's kind of that ability to um, zoom out um, and, and, and see the big picture and, and design and then, and then zoom back down to pragmatically make these things happen. And, and so uh, I encourage people um, whenever possible to, to do both of those things. You know, it's, it's okay to, as for a business major to take a graphic design class. In fact, I, I, you know, that, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> and for an architect major to take a business class. Um, or for a poli sci person to uh, go take a film class. I think, you know, we'll, we'll be better off when, when you can uh, have a more kind of uh, holistic view of, of how these things come together. So. Awesome. Thank you. How was working with architects for this project? Did they just work on the buildings or interiors too? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, inside and outside, I mean, you got all kinds of architects, right? You got the civil architects that are, are working on, um, you, you know, things like structural, like how do we make an ice bridge? <laughs> you got the uh, interior, you know, and, and structural architects. Um, you've got landscape architects that are, are working on um, elements that are, that are kind of more of a native uh, plantings and, and uh, how the, the park itself lays out. And so, um, but what I, what I, came to realize is that you have to, um, architects all have their, their quirks and whatnot, and you works with so many of them. It's important that with any of these professional services that you'll work with, whether it's your accountant, your lawyer, your architect, um, that, that you're actually making sure you're injecting your vision and, and whatnot, and, and not only letting their um, perhaps professional um, opinions drive a project, because um, if you just had their professional experience applied, you're not going to get that Harry Potter world that's behind you, Caitlin, right? Like it just won't happen. And so um, never be ashamed, even if you don't feel like you know exactly what they're talking about when they, when they talk about the uh, architectural jargon or engineering type jargon or legal or accounting, you know, start to ask those things and, and, you know, you're going to apply the right questions and, and logic that it's going to make the project um, have that kind of comeback ability. <laughs> awesome. That's yeah. great to hear. Thank you for answering my question. Yeah. Well, uh, hopefully that was uh, insightful and, uh, you know, spending a Tuesday evening after finals. Um, I, I consider it a privilege that you guys wanted to hang out with me tonight. So, um but uh, happy to, to keep in touch. Um, you, you can feel free to, to share my contact information as wherever you post this. And um, if you guys ever need anything, uh, please feel free to reach out again. All righty. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, spending your time with us and taking it to make that great presentation. All right. Enjoy you guys. Have a good summer. Thanks so All much. All right. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.